I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Before I go further, um, I, I moved somehow to talk about something briefly before I get into mindfulness in general. And that relates to what we were talking about uh, before we officially started at 5.45 p.m., at 6 p.m. rather, and about being exposed, living exposed to the golden wind, whatever that means, including metaphorically. And in our exposure, right, we can also be aware of certain things that are really precious to us, like a bell, a little a bell, or a cat, or a tree, or another person, or a personal practice like the salutation to the sun, um, asana in yoga, or the chance every Wednesday night to be with each other. How precious. And I think we can, of course, err on the side of getting very clingy and possessive and identified with the things that are precious to us, even sacred to us. On the other hand, I think we can often underappreciate them and not bring a kind of care to them that would be really appropriate to how precious they are to us. I can think of certain things or situations that I was careless about that ended in disaster, uh, irrevocable loss of one kind or another. And you know, there's so many things we care for and you know, we can get flooded and it's hard to remember all of them. But just this feeling of valuing, not being burdened by, but valuing what is precious to you, including little things that are just so great. I love the taste of salt on a pretzel, that little crystal of salt. Mm. You know, you look outside, you see a person who actually has goodwill for you, greets you with goodwill, simple goodwill. Oh, thank you. Anyway, what are the things that we can hold tenderly in this world in which that is subject to so much decay and loss and disintegration? Including letting it land in you, the preciousness, preciousness to you of another being, your dog, someone walking down the street, a child you see, um, you know, your partner perhaps. Hmm. Yeah. Mindfulness is a pathway certainly into this recognition of preciousness in part because in the root of the word for mindfulness in Pali, the language of early Buddhism, the root of that word, sati, S-A-T-I, someone might type it into the chat for us all perhaps, sati, uh, the root of that word is memory. So in mindfulness, there is a recollectedness. And as we are recollected with a sustained present moment awareness, we can recognize things that are precious to us. And we can even recognize distractions or urges that move us into carelessness. One of the um, statements traditionally in the fifth precept of not using intoxicants that cloud the mind and lead to carelessness carelessness. So it's, we want to avoid that. Mindfulness can really help us, right? Stay mindful moment by moment while driving next to a big truck, moment by moment, watching your child's first steps or uh, going outdoors and being in beautiful settings. And yet you got to be careful. You don't you know, fall off the edge there. Um, we can bring that quality of recollectedness moment after moment after moment. That's really the essence of mindfulness, sustained present moment awareness. And you might like one of my very favorite books on mindfulness, 
sati patana, sati meaning mindfulness, patana where mindfulness is established, where we located, what we are mindful of. And in uh, Buddhist practice, there are the four establishments of mindfulness, sometimes translated as the four foundations of mindfulness. I particularly like this book. It's just a masterwork from the monk Analyo, Bhikkhu Analyo, A-N-A-L-A-Y-O. A wonderful, wonderful book. And so we are to establish mindfulness in our body, in our mind, in recognizing the world, in observing causes and conditions that lead to happiness or suffering. We are to establish mindfulness. Fundamental uh, instruction from the Buddha. Right mindfulness is one of the eight elements in the noble path that embodies and leads to awakening. Mindfulness alone is not enough. That's why it's not the one-fold path. And in certain circles, people have turned mindfulness into the entirety of the path. Not so, not so. We need other qualities to be present, to be able to sustain mindfulness until we're absolutely um, stabilized in it, in depths often of meditation. We need other things like intention, understanding, uh, self-compassion, the ability to tolerate what we're mindful of if it bubbles up painfully from our own depths. We need other things besides mindfulness to be mindful. And other things besides mindfulness lead to awakening, like opening the heart or uh, engaging in right action, sila, morality, wholesomeness in the world, the cultivation of wisdom. Mindfulness alone uh, is neutral. It is morally neutral. Burglars, snipers, and tyrants can all be quite mindful of what's going on because that helps them be effective in their dastardly deeds. Uh, so we need other things besides mindfulness. That said, um, how can we sustain and deepen and grow this stability of recollectedness, of present moment awareness? How can we actually do that? So in your, in your brain, initially, we exercise top-down regulation so that we can stay mindful rather than being distracted. And in meditation, for example, very often the essence of meditation is to become aware of when you start to go into the default mode network, neurologically located along the midline and spreading to the sides toward the rear of your brain on the top of the cortex. In other words, to be aware of when you start to get sucked into those trains of thoughts, to go off into rumination, you know, in the ruminator, and not do it or come back quickly. So a lot of what meditation is about is noticing that you've gotten distracted again and returning. Distracted, returning again and again and again. And over time, you become more stably um, present. You don't get so distracted habitually. And your top-down regulation gets better. You're more able to, for example, sustain awareness to breathing for 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 breaths in a row. Uh, you're, you're more aware, you're more able to sustain a kind of openness and spaciousness without being distracted by what passes through it. The strengthening of top-down regulation of mindfulness involves different regions in your brain, two in particular, what's called the frontal or anterior cingulate cortex. On the inside kind of of your brain in the midline, there, down a little bit, back a little bit. The cingulate cortex is very involved with error monitoring. It tracks when we're on the path and off the path. So there you are, you're, 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 you're stably on some object of attention like the breath, your mind starts to wander a bit, you know, and you notice that you're wandering. You're paying attention to attention with your cingulate cortex, the frontal anterior regions. That's really good. And research shows that over time, with regular practice, people actually build up tissue in their anterior cingular cortex, in, or including uh, little tiny capillaries, uh, vascular tissue, that bring more and more blood to it so it can be active and get its job done. It's kind of like growing a muscle. Deliberate, top-down, 
executive attention. And that often is what we do in the early stages of meditation uh, in terms of our career as meditators. And even in the beginning of a particular meditation session like tonight, uh, teachers like me will start us out by, you know, focus on your breath, get stable, get centered, establish the intention of meditation, you know, and be determined about it. There's a little bit of determination about it. We're not struggling with our mind, we're not fighting with it, but we're guiding it, we're determined about it. Um, a metaphor that we should be with our mind, like the skillful rider of a horse, neither too loose, or neither too loose nor too tight the reins, okay? Additionally, um, we uh, are involved with the insula, another part of the brain that's very involved with interoception, tuning into ourselves, particularly with things like mindfulness of the body or mindfulness of states of mind, you know, internal, internally directed mindfulness. And here too, um, research shows that with repetition, uh, regular practice of mindfulness uh, meditation, uh, we grow tissue in the insula, this part of your brain, that Therefore, uh, and, and we be just like building a muscle, in effect, when you grow neural tissue and connectivity and improve neural function, you become more able to do things like stay aware of your own inner world in a very broad way, a very recollected way, while sustaining this present moment awareness, staying in the present, not being distracted by what you're aware of in your body or your gut feelings, for example. So we have the cingulate cortex and the insula working hand in hand, you know, staying with each other, right? Staying with each other. And um, it's interesting that, by the way, as a detail, those parts of the brain have been the subject of rapid evolution just over the last several million years, uh, including the development of what are called variously von Neumann neurons or, econ von, or economo neurons, or there we go, von economo, or spindle cell neurons, a particular class of neurons that only humans and other great apes, and also some of the cetaceans have, which enable a lot of self-awareness, it seems, uh, including um, mindfulness of your own interior. Okay, so that's kind of, uh, in, as Jed Olson puts into the, uh, thank you, Jed, the chat, uh, several million years, 10 million years is rapid development of a new type of cell in the nervous system. Um, so this initial phase helps us to sustain the recollectedness of mindfulness. And it's especially important as someone just, you know, sent me a private message. Um, this is especially important if by nature you tend to be distractible by temperament, or you've acquired a certain jumpiness or distractibility through trauma or through, you know, growing up in or being currently in very chaotic environments with a lot of threats or have or being currently under a lot of stress. Naturally, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Oosh. Or if you're dealing with physical illnesses or pain in your body that tend to wear you down or, or worry you when the next pain arises, what kind of meditations um, are really helpful here? Uh, so I want to just name a few specific suggestions that are really grounded in how your brain works. So one, you can really strengthen that internal sort of watchdog, not a mean watchdog, Pick your metaphor, more like a, a kindly guide or guardian of attention that's very aware of when your attention starts to wander. Strengthen that internal guardian if you can, and including that guardian who starts to notice a distraction bubbling up or maybe a sound comes in from the outside and the guardian catches it early, catches it early before you get distracted, all right? So um, that's one thing you can do to strengthen it because it's sort of like if you're riding a horse and your temperament, like some people, is sort of a super mellow one foot in front of the other plow horse, up and down the furrows, fine with me, same furrow, same furrow, day after day. You know, if that's your temperament, you don't need to be a very skillful rider. On the other hand, if your temperament is a um, 
you know, sh really quick quarter horse, Mustang, you know, boom, boom, boom. Well, you really need a skillful rider. Uh, and so um, to that point, you can really strengthen this top-down regulator that is observant of when you get distracted, one. Two, help yourself um, increase the stimulation of whatever you use as an anchor for attention, you know, such as the sensations of breathing. For example, instead of being aware of breathing at the upper lip, you could be aware of breathing in the whole body. Or you could be aware of sensations as you walk or move. Or you could be, you could use something like um, a chant, even out loud, softly or loudly, that keeps you engaged. That will, that will help you. It can become really boring to just pay attention to the sensations around your upper lip. That's a good training for attention. So it'll build a lot of muscles because it's not very interesting, is it, <laughs> over time? But on the other hand, especially if you tend to be distractible, it's really important to give yourself permission to find, for me, it's actually been amazing to really focus on whole body awareness. Uh, I've moved away myself from focusing on the upper lip, which I can do, to just go into the body as a whole, plop, here, sensations occurring, sounds happening, thoughts passing through, presence, being, with as little interfering as possible moment after moment after moment, you know. You can, you can do that, you can be aware of your whole body. So those are really, I think, helpful. Last one that's helpful is shorter periods of meditation. Five minutes, set your timer, or just be aware, look at the clock after a while, no big deal. Um, and do it for shorter periods, you know, sincere practice for five minutes. I urge you, honestly, I don't use the, the urge word very often. I urge you to commit to doing a minute or more, or more a day of meditation. Whatever your form of meditation is, which might include prayer for some people, um, do it. Even if it's the last thing you do before your head hits the pillow, do a real minute every day or more and commit to it. I urge you to that. You will really be benefited by it. I have been benefited enormously by that commitment some decades ago. Okay, so quick response to that. So now though, and this is where I wanna move more into the real, not the real, but actually the, the essence of mindfulness, um, which has to do with gradually relaxing top-down control. And one of the curious and actually provocative findings in research on long-term meditators in their brains is that Long-term meditators actually have less activity in the cingulate cortex uh, than early meditators. And you can imagine a kind of curve over time, let's say time goes this way, where in the beginning people have little activity in the cingulate cortex, top-down control is weak, and then they build up deliberate top-down control and they're working that muscle. And then over time, that deliberate top-down control becomes a habit of present moment awareness. And the top-down effort reduces over time as in effect other parts of the brain get more involved in a kind of whole being, whole body presence, kathunk, stably, here and now. Isn't that interesting? That the way that curve works, okay? So how can we catch that curve? Because a lot of you, are, you know, you've been doing meditation for a while, you can do that deliberate stuff. How do we establish this kind of wonderful sense of effortless presence in which you just have arrived, right? You're no longer struggling with distractions. They're just not very relevant. Plop, you've arrived. How to support that? in your practice. So here I wanna talk a little bit about attention. And attention essentially has two major neurological circuits. A more recent circuit um, involves upper streams, 
you know, processing in your brain. And it, it's very involved with deliberate focused attention where animals, let's say, orient to a stimulus. Something has happened, they orient to it and they zero in on it and they start figuring out what to do about it, including assessing early on how relevant is this to me? Is it, you know, a snake or a stick? Is it just the wind moving the brush or is there a predator about to get me? Okay, so this part of attention could be called orienting or directing or focusing attention. That's what we use early on when we're, um, you know, exercising top-down regulation, all right? But then over time, interestingly, we can return to a more primal mode of attention, which is the simplest mode of all, which is receptive alerting. We're simply receptively re being alerted to the next moment, the next moment, the next moment. Really simple animals with simple nervous systems are rested in, in ongoing alerting. You know, um, like something is happening, something is happening, something is happening. But if you think about it, as we make that transition from effortful control, it's called deliberate top-down regulation, effortful control, and we start moving more and more toward effortless control, control in a loose sense of stability in a certain state of being. As we make that transition, we start moving away from focused attention on something like the breath that has a kind of top-down effort to it, and increasingly, oof, we're simply being alerted right at the front edge of now, as I put it, alerted continuously with just what's happening. Sounds, sensations, thoughts, feelings, happening now and happening. Um, the sense of self happening, no more special than any of the other flotsam and jetsam in the stream of consciousness, right? Selfing happening, you know, possessiveness happening, worries about how others see you happening, sounds happening. Sensation in the toes happening, presence happening, simply being happening, non-interfering happening, heart opening happening, spaciousness, openness, opening, ongoing. You can feel this. You can rest here. And what helps to do that a lot is to disengage from uh, orienting to stimuli and then uh, focusing on their relevance and following after them. That's useful sometimes, sure, in lots of ways, and, um, but it pulls us away from the most surrendered and fundamental kinds of mindfulness in which we start to move increasingly into the ground state of the brain, uh, of the conscious brain, the ground state where there's no deliberate effort at all. Deliberate effort is falling away. No deliberate effort other than the absolutely minimal effort, which itself starts to fall away, uh, to sustain present moment awareness. Disengaging from doing, disengaging from um, planning, or worrying, there's simply this moment of experience, this moment of consciousness, moment after moment. That's the ground. And it's very interesting to start to settle into that ground, which is characterized by doing as little as possible. I asked a friend of mine recently, um, how long do you meditate? And he said, oh, an hour or two. I was like, wow. That's a, that's a long time. He's a very mature practitioner. And then I asked him, what do you do when you meditate? He said, as little as possible. And that becomes very interesting.
So someone privately chatted me here. Um, why is this goal of disengaging helpful to us? Great question. So for me, there's a place absolutely for engaging with various stimuli, right? I engaged the stimuli of planning my talk tonight. Uh, I made sure I pushed the buttons in my camera and recorder. There's a place for that. Uh, politically, you see things happening out in the world, you get engaged with what to do about them. I'm very engaged right now in the development of what I think will be a global compassion coalition. It's really quite promising. Uh, you know, we certainly engage, yeah. And very often we can develop, you know, get swept away with being identified with what we're engaged with, or we start to crave around it, or we personify it, or we identify with it, and then boom, 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 it's a slippery slope to suffering and struggles and conflict with others. On the other hand, we can start to experience ourselves more and more as a kind of spaciousness of awareness of being in which doing is happening. There's a little saying on my on my home office wall from the Dhammapada, to paraphrase it, um, not being busy, happily we live among busy people. And it's there as a reminder to me because I'm a busy person. And we can, we can rest in a state of being without being carried away by busyness. But to do that, it really helps to train in it. Also, when you move into this disengaged state, as I'm describing the ground state, where there's almost no deliberate effort of any kind, there's a non-doing, simply being. That is a portal into the unconditioned. the unborn, the, the ground of ultimate reality, because you yourself are increasingly not trying to birth anything. And um, you start to have a sense that this moment of being um, is very intimate with the universe manifesting, being, locally. And these words might seem very weird or new agey. They're, they're very intimate because we all long to come home. This is our home, you know? Our home is being. Little babies, they come out, they're radiant with being. That's why they're so compelling. They're not trying to do anything or be anyone. What is it about a little baby that apart from being cute or gurgling, just draws us. We look into their eyes and it's like you're looking into infinity. Whoa, we're drawn to that because that's our home. That's our true home. And most of us are homeless. We have an inner homelessness. And so much of the wisdom traditions of the world are helping us to come home, to remember and to remember to remember what it feels like to be home. And as we come into uh, this kind of um, simplicity, when it's appropriate, you know, you can't drive your car fast through rush hour traffic <laughs> this way uh, in the, you know, but you can actually have a, an, a sense in the background of spaciousness and openness and presence and awareness, right? And all rightness as a kind of field in which activity, even frenzied activity sometimes is occurring. We can, we can do that. Um, so we don't always do this, but it really helps during meditation to train in this sense of being the field. Un, the field itself is ongoing. The field itself is undisturbed. The field itself does not arise or pass away to be the field in which experiences are, are occurring. And we can train in that during meditation. Even right now, how about for a minute? We'll do a little practice here. One minute. I see that, I see that finger. One minute. Um, right now, just what's happening? Be 
mindful of the wholeness of yourself. Sensations, sounds, tastes, smells, thoughts, wishes, reactions. Letting it happen. So to finish here, when you meditate, there are different kinds of meditations. Uh, One kind is simply to plop on the couch and relax and let your mind wander and kind of chill out. That's okay. Another kind is to deliberately train your attention, to deliberately steady your mind and stabilize it. Another kind is to cultivate particular qualities like compassion or gratitude. And a very important kind of meditation is to move into doing as little as possible while remaining alert and aware. And things that help us to do that are to disengage from chasing after, you know, experiences moving through awareness, resting and just simply being alert to whatever is appearing as it passes through, and a sense of openness rather than coalescing around any particular object of attention. You know, you want to be the field, be the field. In some ways, metaphorically, we are all individual waves in the ocean. Okay. And in this practice of meditation, there's a growing sense of simply being the ocean happening, happening locally. There's an opening and a spaciousness. And see what happens. See if you can allow yourself. Often, as you get quieter, these subtle forms of discontent or contraction uh, come come up and you can be aware, oh, I could let that go too. Oh, this also, let it go, let it go, let it go. As you open into everything increasingly, that's available to us. It's an emptying. Instead of a gathering and gaining, this aspect of practice, this kind of meditation is an emptying. And when you do it, you then rest in the essence of mindfulness, which is simply nothing but mindfulness. There is just sati, just mindfulness, just ongoing present moment awareness that can actually increasingly feel almost impersonal. It's not even your own. It's not even your awareness. There's simply awareness. There's simply presence. Well, I see questions and comments um, that have come in. Um, Also, as we come into this ground state in which, like, what what's it like to be you when you're not doing anything? You know, what's it like? What's your what's what's the mind like when there's little or no interfering with it? Little or no guiding. Little or no nudging little or no reacting, and there's a sense of simply abiding as, as being altogether, you know, being your, yourself altogether. What happens there also is that insight becomes really available, and you start to realize, wow, every single moment of being me is being constructed by everything. How cool is that? So much releasing in that, you know? And um, 
Also, you start to realize that the sense of self is just one more construction in the field. Uh, it has a certain continuity to it, but it's not special. That's the key. There are sounds, they don't need to be special. You may hear the birds chirping in my backyard through the microphone, I can hear them right now. Um, there are simply sounds, bird sounds. Oh, self, not special either. That starts to happen when you really practice more, kind of grounding out, coming down to the ground state uh, when there's no deliberate doing in your mind. And you start to rest in this weird place where you realize that um, it's all being determined continuously in your consciousness, right? It's all being determined. And you start laughing because you're utterly free. <laughs> when it gets really, 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 really quiet. Um, it doesn't matter. Things matter and they don't matter, you know, when you're that grounded out. So I, I recommend it as the Buddha has in deep practices in which the mind gets very quiet and there's simply presence that is alert and aware. Okay. So I see questions, I see comments. Um, I hope I haven't totally lost you. The simple thing is ride this curve, it, depending on wherever you are. If you need to keep focusing on deliberate top-down top regulation of your mindfulness, great. But see what can happen increasingly when your mindfulness becomes whole body and wholehearted and simply like a sp spacious way of being in which in the core of your being, you're undisturbed. That's, that's it. Okay. Yeah, as Dorothea quotes here 16 minutes after Thich Nhat Hanh, I have arrived, I am home in the here and now. I am solid, I am free, in the ultimate I dwell. Okay, great. Um, for formal practice, preferences at time of day, I, I myself usually meditate when I first get up and also for a few minutes before bed uh, with my wife. And that's kind of nice, sets, sets you up in the beginning. It's nice at the end. Uh, a senior teacher I once read was asked uh, when she meditates and she said, oh, usually around three, two or three in the morning when she wakes up, you know, like she wakes up, getting older, you know, you know, sleep gets more kind of broken up hey, it's a wonderful time to meditate, 2.30 to 3 o'clock in the morning, just, and then go back to sleep. So whatever time works for you in terms of preferences. Um, oh, brainwaves and meditation, there's a lot about that. Uh, brainwaves have to do typically with the surface areas of the brain. They're useful. I'm not a deep expert about that. There's some people who are. Uh, I think it might be interesting to play around with neurofeedback or other things that manipulate or, or train us in, in brain. They use, they use brain waves as feedback. Uh, other than that, you know, there's the stuff about alpha waves, this wave and that wave. The problem is the brain is so big and complicated that different parts of it are having different kinds of brain waves. So it's really how the whole symphony operates anyway. So I just would say that in passing, and there may well be people who are really experts there. Um, let's see, I'm not seeing anyone, yeah. So I'm seeing a private message that I'm gonna reiterate. The, you know, the thing I'm saying here, if I could offer it to you, is to really surface the intuition of home. What is home? And, I, and, our, and our home is our resting state, right? That really is what defines a system, its resting state, its equilibrium state. And um, traditional cultures, first people, our own ancestors as hunter-gatherers, I think spent a lot of time at home in their own 
mind, in their own being, where they were at rest because there wasn't that much to do. There were no phones to check. There was, you know, no TV to watch. There was no basketball game to worry about. They were just home. They were just plopped. And I think we live in a culture and an economy for lots of reasons, you know, well-intended and not, that tends to keep pushing us into homelessness. So we hunger and then we're ripe customers for one commodity after another. It's kind of uh, rebellious to walk around basically saying, no, I'm, I'm good already. Thanks, I'm good already. I'm already home. Yeah, and it'd be nice to have, I like my shirt. Here I am, I'm home in my being. It's nice to have your a nice color shirt. You know, Get a nice book or two, get a bookcase, feed a child, You know, relieve poverty. Uh, while um, you know, being home. Being, so that, that feeling, that intuition of honoring how many minutes a day, how many seconds a day, how many breaths a day do you spend feeling at home in yourself, at ease, undisturbed, undefended, unbothered, uninvaded, unthreatened, Huh? while knowing that you can still be very functional, including putting up boundaries and barriers and dealing with problems, dealing with people who are threatening and so forth. But in the core of your being, how many seconds a day or breaths a day do we spend really feeling? <sighs> you know that sense you get? Mingya Rinpoche uses this metaphor. You come home from a long trip and you just drop your bag and you plop <sighs> home. So if I can offer a practice to you this week, and it could be a discussion topic in the breakout rooms if you want to stick around for those. All right? It's to deliberately come home to yourself multiple times a day, at least once a day. When you meditate, maybe in the morning or at night or another time, or maybe when you offer gratitude at a meal or a prayer of some kind. Home. And if it's hard to feel at home, then that is very useful to be aware of. And it gives you target things to help yourself with and maybe that's a clue if it's hard to be home, that there are practices to develop like, like meditation or calming your body or becoming more familiar with, more intimate with the sense of simply being. So I encourage that to you this coming week to remember to come home and to notice when you are home and enjoy being home. Enjoy being home, which will gradually um, train your brain to seek homecoming and to value it and to, to rest more stably in it over time. And if you like in the discussion group, you might ask yourself this question, you know, to what extent do you feel at home in your own being? And what could you do, understanding the challenges to this that are real in our busy, scary world, um, sometimes scary world, uh, you know, uh, is there anything you could do to help yourself claim the right to be home? A lot of it is just claiming the right. No, busy world. No, hijackers of attention. No, you know, uh, spam email, or, you know, robocallers. No, you know, no other people. I'm... I'm home. I'm here to be home, right? What might help you do, to do that increasingly? So I wish you well, and I want you to know that one of the absolute deepest homecomings in my life is, is doing this each week with you, coming home with you. And I'm very grateful for that. So let's just take a minute, take three breaths. <sighs> to come home. Home is presence. Open. 
heartfelt. Content in your core, aware, alert. Okay. Feeling okay in your core. Home.